Act One, Scene Two. The lights come up, revealing a lone figure on the fore stage. He is the narrator, an Englishman in his mid sixties. He's carrying a book, a journal, opened at the marker, which is a black veil, and appears to be reading something. When he looks up at the audience, a little startled, he then addresses the audience directly. Oh, pardon me. I was just pondering over the words and events of that fateful evening. To the Westerner, this story may seem shocking, but then again, this is not a story of the West. Before 9/11, it would be unthinkable for a Westerner to find himself in Razumov's predicament. He couldn't even begin to know how an autocratic government represses ideas and guards its power to defend its existence against any possible or potential threat. Until that day of infamy. Unless he were deluded or something, he, he he could never imagine himself arbitrarily thrown into prison and tortured as a matter of routine investigation. And though it's not unthinkable today, this is not what concerned Mr. Razumov the most. No. More importantly, a profound realization. Of the long-term consequences was beginning to fasten itself into his consciousness. That, by this uncanny twist of fate, Mr. Razumov's life and world, as he knew it from now on, would be turned upside down and irrevocably altered. It wouldn't have to be so dramatic. Just a simple expulsion from the university. At the very least, with no possibility to continue his studies anywhere else, at any time in the future. That's enough to completely ruin a young man like him, so dependent on his intellectual abilities to make his life in the world. As a young Uzbek, for him to be implicated or in any way associated with an act of terrorism. Means that he will, inevitably, and irrevocably, sink into the underworld among criminal elements, among the victimized, destitute, desperate night hawks of the city. The lights fade, and then come back on, though dimly lit. Razumov is alone on stage in front of the curtains. With vehement sarcasm, he mocks Saifuddin's words. And you, you have no one belonging to you, no ties, no one to suffer if this comes out. Because of that, must all that I do have be taken from me? For it is a crime. Murder is murder. Period. The curtains open to reveal a tavern. It is the scene of a rough and greasy crowd. Some are seated while others are carrying on and carousing. It is noisy. Someone is playing an accordion. The waiter, a wild-haired youth in a pink, partially unbuttoned shirt, appears. The owner is nearby. I'm looking for Zeynidin, the man of horses. Waiter, <laughs> Zeynidin. <laughs> Good luck. He's not here. <laughs> Razumov. What? I thought he worked and lived here. Just then, the owner, a vile, bony, short man in a dirty cloth cap and down to his heels, hands tucked into his belt, steps up. He confirms derisively in a sing-song voice, "Yes, that's true. 
but well, let us just say that Zenidin got his skinful early in the afternoon. <laughs> I suppose he went away with his bottle to keep it up among his horses. <laughs> There's laughter from the crowd. Razumov is furious as he strikes a table with his fist, shouting, You lie! There's a pause. As everyone turns to him with bleary, drunken, unwashed faces, a tramping woman carousing stop. There's studied laughter and murmuring. A husky man protests, also singing along. <laughs> there now, settle down, young man. No need for that, waiter. The gentleman won't believe that Zay Nidin is drunk. The crowd laughs. From the corner, a rough-bearded man in a hoarse voice shouts aloud, singing along. Curse that driver of thieves! What do we want with him? We're all honest folk here. Owner. Come along, young man. He smiles cunningly and lights a lantern. He leads Razumov to another section of the four stage, while the curtains quietly close behind him. The other actors join in the fun, singing the lines and dancing. I will show you that I am not lying. You see, his woman ran away from him last night. Poor fellow. Bah! Angry man. What an awful hag she was anyway. <laughs> Wait. <coughs> They're always running away from him, that driver of devils. Owner. And he, 60 years old already, and he still can't get used to it. Man, a born fool, Zaynidin. He always flies to the bottle, saying, Who could bear life in our land without vodka? The waiter, a proper Uzbek, this Zaynidin, no doubt about that. No heavy hearts for me, he exclaims. Owner, bring out the bottle and take your ugly mug out of my face. Ha <laughs> ha, what a fine fellow he is. The lights appear in the opposite area of the four stage as the owner holds the lantern over the prone form of a man, Zainidin, fully dressed for the outdoors, lying in a disheveled mess, head lost in a cloth hood, some straw with his boots protruding. He is snoring. The actors are animated as they continue to mock and jeer Zainidin singing out their lines. Angry man. And he's always ready to drive this Zenidin. Saint or devil, night or day. Why, it's all one to him. Waiter. If only he could free his heart from sorrow. <laughs> Owner. I don't care who the hell you are, he says. Just tell me where the hell you want to go. That's all I need to know. Man. Why, he would drive Satan himself to hell and back, and then he'd come chirping, chirping back to his horses. Waiter, with a few coins clinging in his pockets, he's ripe for another drink. Owner, ha, many of the devils driven by Zainidin are now clanking their chains in the prisons of Karimov. Razumov, call him, wake him up. Owner, get up, get up, you filthy swine. Driver of devils, get up. <laughs> it's no use. You see for yourself how he is. He's dead to the world. Not even the devil beating his wife will wake him now. <laughs> I can't help you anymore. He picks up the lantern and exits. At first, Razumov seems stunned that all that he has been containing until this time bursts into a wild rage, possessing him like a madman. Ah! <sighs> The vile beast, I shall wake you. Give me something that I can. He looks around, notices a pitchfork in the corner, grabs it, breaks it in two, and then he beats Zaynidin with the stick. Zaynidin awakes. The lights show him in a blank stare. I'm not sure whether he's awake or dreaming. He pauses and then falls back asleep. Razumov is fighting for his breath as he tosses the broken stick away great heavy strides, he exits. The lights go out briefly and then return on the fourth stage. 
Razumov is alone on the street. Street sounds are heard in the background. Ah, what a brute. Well, I'm glad I beat him, the supposed servant of Islam, Saifuddin's bright soul. He pauses. It's obvious that the physical exertion has relaxed him somewhat, yet he's now possessed with a tranquil but unquenchable hatred for Saifuddin. And what is he doing right now, that Wahhabist inspired by his holy jihad? He's lying on my bed, that's what he's doing, as if dead, with the back of his hands over his eyes. I'll kill that bastard when I get home. It's no use. I'm being crushed. I, I can't run away. Where can I go to? The others, they have an elsewhere, a refuge. But what do I have? I have nothing. Not even the refuge of confidence. Who in all this great land can I go to with this tell? Stamping his foot on the ground. Ah, oh, Islam, a sullen, tragic mother, hiding her face under the burqa mourning the loss of her innocent children. And what does this Saifuddin mean anyway with his indignation, his, his talk of Sharia and Allah's justice? Of course, it ends in nothing but disruption, murder, terror, followed by yet another form of oppression. State-sponsored terrorism breeds naked terrorism, and the cycle of terror becomes a state of permanent war perpetually repeating itself under another name, yet it's all a war of terror just the same. Those thousands suffer, the sea germinates in the night, and out of the dark soul springs the perfect plant. Yeah, well, a volcanic eruption brings sterility, yet it is the ruin of perfect ground. And am I, I, who love my country and my religion, I, who have nothing but that to love and put my faith into, am I to have my future, perhaps my usefulness, ruined by that militant fanatic? Who is this Saifud in any way? Do I want his death? No. I would save him if I could. But what can be done now? He's a withered member who must be cut off. If I must perish through him, let me at least not perish with him associated against my will with his somber folly. Why should I leave a false memory? Just to perish in vain for a falsehood? What a meaningless, miserable fate. Suddenly, we hear the sound of two cars colliding. One man yells, Thou vow, wretch! Razumov shakes his head, somewhat distracted, and as he's about to continue, he's suddenly stopped in his tracks. The lights appear on another section of the stage to reveal Saifuddin lying before him with his hands over his eyes, just as Razumov had left him. Razumov rubs his eyes in disbelief. He searches for the keys in his pocket to see whether maybe Saifuddin has somehow escaped. He pulls out the keys and, and, and then he looks again at the body. Then he looks at the audience, visibly disturbed and frightened. He walks away from it. And then as he looks back, the lights that were over the phantom are off again. He turns to the audience and he whispers in a choked voice, exactly as if alive, right in my way too. Oh, this is an extraordinary experience. I have no choice but to betray him now. What does it matter? A man can only betray his own conscience. Th there must first be some kind of moral bond between people before any betrayal can occur. And, and, and where is the moral bond here? By, by what bond of common faith, of common conviction, am I obliged to let that fanatical idiot drag me down with him? To the contrary, every obligation of true courage lies in the opposite direction. Who can reproach me? Did I ask for his confidence? No. Okay, yeah, I did consent to go and see his Zaynidin. I broke a stick on that fool's back, too. Well, I'd best keep that circumstance to myself. But to whom can I tell this all to? He's suddenly struck by a thought. 
I know. Yes, of course. Why didn't I think of him before? A former senator. A dignitary of high esteem and reputation. I don't know why I didn't think of him before. He exits while trying to shout down a taxi. The lights go out for the scene change.